Improve and, and to improve you, what do you do? You, you build upon what you know before. At the very early stages of any technology, or even your learning on, a, on an MBA, for example, at the very early stages, quite often you have to spend a lot of time making very little progress because you've got to learn the skills of referencing, you've got to learn the skills of writing, you've got to learn the skills of reading and doing assignments again. So actually, just like with your MBA study skills, it's not a straight curve going up. It's actually a curve that looks more like this. So over time, you actually make very, very little in increase um, in improvement in performance because you're learning the basics. And before you learn the basics, you can't improve your performance. So again, if you take the analogy with, with your uh, MBAs, you've got to learn how to reference properly, how to um, apply models, how to write and read again in an academic style. And it might be your third or fourth module before you suddenly, everything clicks. It suddenly occurs to you what we mean when we say, don't describe, analyze. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Um, and suddenly you realize what we mean when we say don't describe stuff, analyze it, and suddenly your performance shoots up. And this is what's happening here, really. If you think about genetic engineering, for example, it took them a long, long time to map out the, the human genome. But once they've done that, one can imagine a rapid increase in all sorts of medical possibilities. I'm not quite sure where we are on this curve, and well, that's one of the problems I'll talk about in a minute. But you can see you need to get the basics before you can start improving performance. Now, one thing I'd like to say, I'll, I'll talk about a few, some of the features of this, this curve. Firstly, the x-axis is not time, it's effort. Just because we allow time to slip doesn't allow us to improve our MBA performance. It, it's our effort. And it's the same with technology. You've got to invest the effort and the, so the, the R&D time, the um, manpower, the, the, all those sorts of investments to improve. So it's not just that you can allow time to elapse and things improve. You've got to put effort in. So the x-axis um, is effort. The y-axis is performance, and that performance could be many different things. For an engine, it could be performance in terms of efficiency, how many miles you can go for a gallon. Um, it could be acceleration. Um, it could be uh, top speed. So depending on the innovation that we're looking at, and it could be a service here, This innovation could be how could we improve the, um, the speed by which we are able to open new accounts. Um, and it might be all sorts of innovations occur that allow you to improve that, that performance. So performance could be measured in all sorts of ways in relation to um, a particular uh, innovation. So not only do you take time to learn the basics. Once you've learned those basics, you have rapid increase in performance. But then what happens? You reach a peak of performance. Um, so for example, you can't get any more computer chips on a square millimeter. You can't get any more mileage out of a, um, a gallon of petrol. So what you see is, in most technologies, there's a slow increase in performance, then a rapid increase, and then it starts to tail off as you start to hit what might be called the natural limits. Yeah? There will be natural limits about how fast we can make a car because of, I don't know, gravity or whatever, the sort of physical limits. And the only way that we might be able to improve that performance is actually developing a new technology. Yeah, so we'll, we'll talk a bit about computers in a minute, but the question then 
is how can we use this model to make strategy? If you are approaching the top of this curve, what do you think that means in terms of your strategy? Sorry? Yeah, in terms of... Start looking for alternatives. What this is saying is, if you're approaching this here, you, not, you start, need to look in, start looking for alternatives. Because if you aren't, someone else is going to. And if they, if they come up with a, with a new technology to, to make a computer faster, and you haven't built that competence, you lose that market share. I suspect companies like Kodak and Canon did exactly what you just said. They realized that their technology was about to become obsolete. They realized that their competence was about to become obsolete, and they started to try and understand the skills and competence you needed for digital technology. Um, those that didn't died. The question is, although this says something interesting about how it takes a lot of effort to make a small amount of progress, how you can make rapid progress, and then you should look for the natural limits. It's actually very difficult to find out where you locate yourself on that particular um, S-curve. But nevertheless, it, it's quite useful in terms of thinking that as a company, in terms of strategy, you need to be thinking about at what point do you need to look for new alternatives. And it's not just a theoretical model, actually. There's lots of data that shows that this model or this shape of curve exists. So there's quite a lot of data on, for, ex for ex this example is about the car, so power-volume ratio. This is an example of the um, computer industry and microchips. And you can see that very, very early on, the, the, imp the improvement in performance of computer chips was very, very, very slow. And suddenly, if you compare the number of transistors, these tiny little things that do all the calculations in here, 2004 to 1971, you could get 2,300 transistors onto a square inch. Now you can get over half a billion which is incredible, really. So you can see this rapid, rapid um, performance increases. Um, I have a quick question. Yep. Your previous slide on automobiles, mm -hmm. it carried on up to 1980, and it looked as if we had reached the top of the limits of the automobile industry. Yeah. We're now 20, 20 odd years into the future. Um, what's happening to the curve? <laughs> Good question. I mean, I don't know much about the automobile industry, but actually, through my lifetime, I haven't seen I haven't a car still, um, you know, still acts like it did 20, 30 years ago. I don't think we've actually made much progress. Um, I suppose what hasn't happened is there has an alternative hasn't come along, um, and that the reason might be because car companies and oil companies are very powerful, um, and if you look at the companies that are likely to replace petrol cars with, I don't know, electric cars um, are, are the same companies and they've got vested interests not to replace the petrol car. So it might simply be that there hasn't been a viable alternative and that, that might be because the industry has manipulated what's going on. But I, to, be, to be honest, I think there hasn't been a great deal of performance increase in cars. It happened largely very early on, probably the 1930s, 40s, and it's fairly much tailed off, I think. The other thing is, actually, there's what, another aspect of this is that um, society's uh, view of performance of a car has changed. So issues that are important now in terms of performance have changed to things like safety, fuel efficiency, rather than power and performance. So 
What you're also seeing is not just a move to perhaps a limit of performance, but perhaps society is requesting a different set of performance criteria. So there could be partly that answer as well. There's been a shift in emphasis of R&D to different factors. But all these are actually very strategic issues about how companies think about their future. If you've got any questions, just jump in and, and uh, intervene. <coughs> So the question is, if data from companies and of sectors shows there's this kind of pattern, why does it happen? Why is it that we seem to see technology going along this curve? Why isn't it that we see lots of different companies doing different things um, and there actually be no pattern at all? And part of the answer is, not something about the technology. It's not technologi technological determinism. It's not, the te it's not that technology has a particular path and we just are pushing that technology along that path. We are making choices as companies and individuals and society about what we believe are the right solutions, what we believe are the right types of innovations. And so one of the reasons why innovation follows particular paths is not because we are pushing technology and it's simply revealing itself. It's because we have a particular mindset about technology um, and particular technological solutions. So if you think about it, um, if we're looking at, looking at uh, a car, one of the reasons the technology hasn't changed perhaps very much is because we train engineers at universities. These engineers are trained by people with existing technology. So you perpetuate the existing mindset. Yeah? This is called a paradigm. So if you train engineers in what we do now, you end up with engineers who continue to do what we do now. And if you train engineers with a particular mindset, then what you find is that that mindset closes your mind to certain solutions and problems and makes you focus on particular issues. So one of the reasons you see technology unraveling in a certain way and moving in a certain way is because our engineers, for example, are trained in a certain way with a certain mindset. So they all see similar problems and they all see other things which they feel are irrelevant. So when we see this curve, it's not because technology is going to, it's not because that's what's going to happen if we just put effort in. It's because we put particular effort into particular problems because we have been trained to think that way. So science, in a way, although we think science and innovation and technology are all about creativity, it's actually about creativity within a particular mindset. So one, have you seen pictures of horses where they have that blinkered? It's, it's essentially that. Engineers and scientists can be very good at the things they've been trained in. But actually, you'll find there are very few mavericks. Mavericks create interesting, different, creative ideas. So the movement along... I mean, that's the irony in a way. Innovation is created by um, people who are not necessarily innovative and not mavericks. Uh, they're simply pushing the same technology further rather than looking for completely different solutions. So when you see this pattern of, of, of a f improvement of a performance over time, it's actually a social phenomenon rather than a technological phenomenon because it's the way we train our engineers. It's the way that um, companies... Uh, um, push their technology. Does that make sense? So I think when we think about technology and we think about um, why things the way are the way they are, it's, it's, it's social, really. It's decisions we make as managers, companies. It's the way that we educate our managers, our engineers, our social scientists. <coughs> 